CBS Sports. High drive, center field, the wall, grand slam. This is magnificent. Got a fantasy question? Email fantasybaseball at cbsi.com. Get ready to win your league. Where fantasy becomes reality. Now here's Frank, Scott, Chris, and Adam. Mailbag time. Welcome into Fantasy Baseball today on Saturday, March 20th. Frank Stanfield joined by Chris Towers. Gave Scott White the podcast off because, frankly, he is working too hard. What's going on, Chris? How are you holding yeah, up? Yeah, I guess I'm not. I guess I'm not working too hard. That's <laughs> fine. It's okay. We gave you the past couple of podcasts off as well. Come on, Chris. One. One. Just one. I think we gave you two, didn't we? It was two, but there was another one in between. Maybe two in between. Don't. Don't. Don't besmirch my good name. I'm a hard worker. You are a hard worker, as is Scott White. You guys are both hard work. How are you holding up, Chris? Because fantasy baseball draft season is here. You're writing a ton of content there. You're also doing fantasy football content simultaneously. So how are you? Yeah, ho- yeah. I've been writing the fantasy football today newsletter uh, every day this week for free agency. I uh, thought there would be more news than there has been, so it's actually required. Weirdly, it's required me to do more work because there's been less news. Because now I'm like. Well, I got to justify this newsletter's existence somehow. Uh, You know, I I can't just do a newsletter about John Brown signing. So, uh, but yeah, subscribe to the Fantasy Football Today newsletter. There's a reason for it to exist. I think it's good. Subscribe to the Fantasy Baseball Today newsletter as well. CBSSports.com slash newsletters. Took the words right out of my mouth. Look at there this you go. professional. You can honestly sign up for all the CBS Sports newsletters. There's an HQ one that gives you a bunch of betting picks as well if you're into that kind of thing. But of course, the fantasy football and the fantasy baseball newsletters as well. Today on the pod, of course, it's mailbag. We'll answer your Apple podcast review questions. We got some emails and we have a new replacement for regulators. Adam has gone to the, the fantasy cops on the fantasy football side of things. So we'll have some of that later on. Uh, and thanks, everyone, for sending in your emails. We have so, so many. I'm trying to answer them individually outside of the podcast as well uh, because you have questions, and we are we are trying to give you answers. Let's jump into these Apple, Apple Podcast review questions first, Chris, and we will start from Beast Asaurus. Just took over a, a Dynasty team with a Miners roster. Okay, thanks. There's no chance I could win this year and probably not next year. What type of trade package do you think would be fair for my Trevor Bauer, I think his trade value may be at its highest currently. It's funny you bring that up, Bisasaurus, because I wrote about, I think it was six or eight sell high candidates in Dynasty back in, I want to say October or November, a long time ago. And Trevor Bauer was one of them. Given the volatility we've seen in years past, obviously he's coming off a sub two ERA. He just won the Cy Young. Selling high, that's the, the concept here. Is, is I think what you're looking at. I don't know that his value will ever be higher, Chris. So I actually agree with trying to sell Bauer now if you are rebuilding. Yeah, I mean, you're never going to see Trevor Bauer have the the flashy eye-popping ratios like he did last season again. And he is a 30-year-old starting pitcher who's logged a lot of innings. So, you know, the, those guys are healthy until they're not. Um, and, you know, it's possible that, you know, his injury risk is probably increasing every year. and you know, I think he'll be good this year. I think I have him as my SP6, so I'm not necessarily down on Trevor Bauer. But yeah, if you're looking to sell and you don't like it doesn't sound like there's any reason for this guy to hang on to him, um, then yeah, I think right now is the the perfect time to sell in a dynasty league. And, you know, the the, the kind of package I think you're probably looking for, I, I think you're probably... Like, obviously, if you could get uh, Andrew Vaughn or Julio Rodriguez or Spencer Spencer Torkelson, one of those really high-end guys, um, Jared Kalenic, you know, you do that if you have the opportunity, obviously. But, you know, it might be harder to get some of the guys who are right on the cusp of making the major leagues. And so I think you can't afford to be... um, a little more patient and look for guys who are a a little less um, 2021 relevant. So, you know, maybe you're thinking about CJ Abrams, Austin Martin, Marco Luciano, um, 
Bobby Witt would have been one of those guys, but you know, uh, he's had like nine really good spring games. So I guess he's not anymore. Um, I would look at Scott White's top 100 prospects and just kind of try to identify some guys who are in the, um, you know, the top 20 who, you know, are, are probably going to be in double A AA or triple A this year rather than making their major league debut. And, you know, see if you can get at least one of those. And, you know, I think you probably want at least another top 100 prospect, maybe more. Yeah, if you're not going to compete this year or next year, and you know that, it sounds like you probably need quantity of prospects. I don't know that. Sure, yeah. That you'll, that you'll be able to get a Torkelson. Of course, try it if you can. I mean, shoot high. That doesn't. Yeah. It doesn't hurt. But uh, I think trying to get a a package of either prospects or young players, if you can get even you know some young ish starting pitchers, uh, you know Ian Anderson, if it's possible. Yeah. I don't know, if it's possible Jesus Lazardo, names like that. Even. Uh, on the lower end, if you can get a, a like an Aaron Savale and a prospect, yeah. some kind of package like that together, that, that's something I would be. Yeah, looking I, th- I think the point about, you know, when you're looking three years in the future now, realistically, maybe two, um, you know, the point about looking for quantity is is an important one. And, you know, given the the attrition rate of even very good prospects, you know, you're looking at probably half of top 20 prospects probably busting as major leaguers um you know it's also possible that you might want to target like four guys who are you know top 150 prospects maybe um and you know making one of those guys one of those like 17 year olds who you know could make a big leap i don't have any off the top of my head right now unfortunately because uh my prospect knowledge only goes so deep. I'm sure Scott's got some. Yeah, I mean, there were there were some in this year's first year player draft. Wilman Diaz, some yeah. middle infielders. Uh, Carlos, it's Carlos Colmenares is one of them. But uh, yeah, I mean, those guys are super far away. They're middle infielders, 17 years old. So uh, if you want to, if you want to take more throws at the dartboard, sure, why not? This next one's from Plumster 27. Was wondering if you guys were going to do a show on the underdog best ball drafts. It's a lot of fun to do and requires no work from the player once the team is drafted. So this is a lot like best ball fantasy football, which I'm sure you're aware of, Chris. Uh, but it's you draft your team and you do nothing else. It's they give you points all season long based on your weekly scoring optimal lineup. So yep. I don't have the best ball scoring format in front of me, but one thing that I have always done when I've played in fantasy baseball best ball drafts is if you do not have to take relief pitchers or closers, if you just have to take pitcher spots, I do not draft a single closer because we talk about how volatile the position is. I mean, year in and year out from a week to week basis, you don't know what's going to happen. So if I can just skip all closers and just take as many starting pitchers as I can on my best ball teams, that's exactly what I'm doing. Yeah. I saw, yeah, I'm in a couple of best ball drafts. One is a like weird best ball dynasty league where we're drafting 50 players and, it's 30 teams and it's just we're like 700 picks in and we're barely halfway done. It's, it's wild. Um, but we, we were all in uh Raz slam, I think all three of us. And, uh, that's a best ball draft. And, uh, I saw Andy Barron's from Yahoo had a really interesting approach to that draft. I think he drafted 15 straight starting pitchers starting in like, I don't know. I think it might've been like the 14th round or something. It's a super deep draft. Um, And that I I think quantity over quality actually makes a lot of sense in a best ball format because there are going to be weeks where Trevor Bauer makes one start and gives up four runs and isn't one of your starters. There's probably going to be three or four of those weeks. Whereas in, you know, your regularly, you're just starting him no matter what in a best ball league, he's not going to count for those. So, um, you know, that there are going to be probably 10 or 12 weeks where even someone who we don't think is necessarily great, like Zach Davies is worth starting. So, uh, that's one where I think not paying for pitcher in best ball is probably the way to go. And if I am reading this correctly, this is an article from RotoWire breaking down the underdog fantasy scoring. You do not have to draft. You do not have to have draft catchers. It's just okay, that's 
Right. It's it's positionless hitters. So obviously just volume is going to matter so much more. And, and they talk about that here as well. So players who hit near the top of lineups, yeah. obviously you're going to have more plate appearances. So that will give you more volume. That's what I would be looking at in this format. And you don't have to start relief pitchers either. So again, I'm not drafting any closers there. Even what you might consider a fringy starting pitcher. You mentioned Zach Davies. This article uses Ryan Yarbrough as an example. That's another yeah. one there. Just don't draft closers. There's too much volatility there. Uh, that is if you are playing in best ball leagues. This one's from Ha Ha Ha. Had to go all the way back to December to get a prospects episode. Can we get a new one? Well, that one was with the Welsh and, and Scott, and it was a great podcast, by the way. And I will just point out that not much has changed since December in terms of prospects. And anything that has changed, we have talked about on the podcast yeah. a ton. So anything regarding Bobby Witt and Andrew Vaughn, we have talked about that a ton recently. So uh, I don't know what you're talking about, man. What's the deal with Marco Luciano? Should I be using my number one minor league draft pick on him? Mm, well, uh, I mean, depends who else is available. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. He's not the number one hitting prospect in baseball. I think Scott has him like fifth in his top 100 prospects. He has um, him 12th. 12th. Okay. So, you know, if. If Julio Rodriguez is available, you shouldn't draft Marco Luciano, but he is a very good prospect. Um, so, you know, I, I think it just depends on who else is available, but, um, you know, there is a chance that he's up this, you know, that, that also should factor in. He, he should be relatively close. It's, it's always hard to say with guys who were, uh, far away in 2019 how much they developed in 2020 playing at the alternate sites whether their teams are viewing that as like okay he got a new level we can jump him up two levels now um you know that that's hard to answer i will just quickly remind people who scott has higher than marco luciano in his rankings that would be wander franco with the rays mackenzie gore with the padres jared kelnick with the seattle mariners Spencer Torkelson with the Tigers, Julio Rodriguez with the Mariners, Andrew Vaughn with the White Sox, Adley Rutschman with the Orioles. That's, that's and kind of incredible. Uh, Marco Luciano is one for 18 with 13 strikeouts in 19 plate appearances in this spring. So I don't think he's going to force his way up yet. And he's only 19 years old. So that shouldn't be surprising. Uh, he had a 981 OPS in 47 games between low A and rookie in 2019. So, you know, it's possible we see him in double A this year. And then look, once a player hits double A, you know, they they could be an injury away at any point. That's always the way I view it. It's not necessarily all players will get called up from double A, but that's when you start putting them on, you know, the call up radar. Yeah. It's possible. I, I think we probably won't see Luciano up this year, but anything could happen. He's only 19 years old. Um, yeah. I would argue with Scott's ranks. I would have Luciano ahead of Adley Rutschman, but I know that Scott likes to rank guys who are closer in proximity to the majors uh, higher in his prospect. Yeah. Rankings. And, you know, there's the catcher of it all. Like Adley Rutschman could be up this season as a catcher. So it's still like it's possible he steps on the field and is the best catcher in fantasy. It's unlikely. Um, but you know, I, that, that position scarcity, that is one the really catcher is the only one where it really matters. This next one is from Chris's cat. <laughs> I mean, I, are your cats around right now, Chris? I'm not going to tell you to grab your cat and bring him on screen, but David Bowie is here or sorry. I did. I had this mistake earlier. Liz lemon is here. David Bowie is, I believe, uh, the last text I received from my wife, she's hiding under our bed while the dog is trying to play with her and she doesn't want any part of that. Which of your cats is your favorite? Or can you not say out loud because they're listening? Um, <laughs> I'm not just saying this because Liz Lemon's in the room, but her and I have a very special relationship. I love all of my uh, children equally, but Liz Lemon, uh, she cuddles in my arms every night while we sleep. I hold her like a teddy bear. It's the cutest thing in the world. So, you know, there, there's a special bond there. 
All right, so let's actually answer the question from Chris's cat. What do you think of Garrett Crochet in a standard 5x5 Roto League with saves plus holds instead of saves? Could he be a potential Devin Williams type this season with the White Sox using him later in games? Garrett Crochet was a first round pick in 2020 and then he debuted last year, which is crazy because yeah. I mean you very rarely see that happen especially in a shortened season. Uh but you know he was a lot of fun to watch pitch. He only pitched 6 innings but Eight strikeouts, not a single walk. Throws was extremely hard, 99, 100 miles per hour. And Chris, I think you wrote about Alex Reyes this year kind of being that swingman type role yeah. and how he has value in fantasy. I don't know that Crochet will be a swingman type, but I do think that he can be really valuable because of the ratios and strikeouts that he provides. Yeah, I um, I guess the yeah the question is what what's the usage going to be? because he was not a full-time starter in college. Uh, he was used as a reliever last season. He's had some arm troubles uh, in recent years, including right at the end of last season. I think he... I don't know if he left the, the last game of the season with an injury, but he, he definitely had something uh, with I his arm. I think he did. In the postseason, I think it happened. Yeah, so there's... um. You know, it, it, it's possible he may only be like a 60-inning mid reliever guy or he could be like you mentioned that Alex Reyes guy and um I wrote last week about how non closer relievers can be more valuable than ever this season and specifically guys who could get to 90 to 100 innings like Alex Reyes uh Dustin May and Tony Gonsolin who should also start um I really like like filling out my pitching staff with those kind of guys now um crochet you know, I I would expect he'll be a lower inning guy than those, but you know, if they're trying to stretch him out, maybe um, you know, maybe they do let him you know throw two to three innings at least occasionally. Um, I'm trying to look back. I, I'm I'm sure uh, the White Sox don't have the they certainly don't have the same manager, and they don't they probably don't have the same front office. I'm not sure, but you know, looking back at when Chris Sale made a similar jump. Uh, as a very young pitcher, they pretty much just used him as a regular reliever. Uh, 71 innings in 2011 in 58 games. So there were some multi-inning outings, but uh, for the most part in 2011, he was just a straight reliever and occasional closer. And then he went to 192 innings the next year. So, you know, there, there's there's some precedent for that. And that I would guess that's more like his role this year. But in a saves plus holds league, he could be really good. Mm -hmm. We've said this repeatedly. In saves plus holds, you really just want to draft dominant relievers on good teams. And that's exactly what I think Eric Crochet is going yeah. to be. The may problem is he might be third in line, maybe fourth in line for saves. I think definitely no more than third. I, I would guess Aaron Bummer's ahead of him. Yeah, Bummer would be. And I... I mean, Kopex is going to be in the bullpen to start the year. I don't yeah, know I could see how him being a dominant closer if if they decide to leave him there. Yeah, I so I don't know what the pecking order will be in terms of like sixth, seventh, eighth inning type yeah. roles, but I assume Bummer will be the eighth. Liam Hendricks will be in the ninth, and yeah. then some kind of combination of Crochet or um, who's the guy I just brought up? Michael Kopech and Kopech, Ronaldo yeah. Lopez and, or Carlos Rodon could be in the rota in the bullpen as well. Yeah, so keep that in mind. Um, Crochet did make five appearances last year. One of them was a multi-inning appearance. He pitched for two innings, so there's a chance that we can see him use that way again this year as well. This next one is from Whiskey Tango 10 Hi, Terry, Larry, and Austin. Hmm. Terry, Larry, and Austin. Oh, uh, hold on. Let me see if they're... I mean, I am. I had was. I'm very uh, bad at these, and I, I admit it. So that makes it. Yeah, okay. the the thought I had was WWE, Terry Hogan, but no, that doesn't make any sense. Don't listen to me. Yeah, that's. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know well, that. Because would... why would it be Terry Hogan and then Steve Austin? Why would it be his last name? So yeah. don't listen to me. I don't know what I'm talking about. Someone please tell me. I'm sure it's obvious. This always happens where we don't know what it is, and someone's like, "Oh, it was." The Detroit Tigers starting pitching staff in their 1981 World Series win or whatever year they won. I don't remember. Yeah, I was trying alive. to think of people named Terry, and I'm getting like Terry Collins, Terry Francona. Terry Rozier. Austin Austin Meadows. T 
Terry Rozier, Larry Bird, and Austin Rivers. There you go. There you go. We got it. I already had the number one pick in a head-to-head category league with walks and quality starts as extra categories. I traded some picks, and I now have picks one and two, but I have no second, third, or ninth round picks. How would you handle having the first two picks in a head-to-head categories league? Would you go Acuna and Tatis, Soto and Tatis, Acuna and DeGrom? Oh, man. I think... So of the the big five hitters, Acuna, Trout, and Soto are the ones who should walk the most. Uh, Acuna saw that big spike in his walk rate last season. I, I I think Trout is probably, you know, he might lead the league in walks. So I think you have to consider him there. Um, didn't, didn't Soto walk more than Trout last year? I just think so, but walk. yeah, I, I think his walk rate was around twenty percent last season, which is. 21%. Incredibly high. 21% uh, Soto. And he's been 16% in his career before, so he walks a ton. Um, Take Juan Soto and Jacob DeGrom. I'm just going to say it. Get yeah, because DeGrom should be great in quality starts and walks, especially um, you know, for a high-volume reliever where or starter, whereas you look at like... You Darvish has had some control issues. Trevor Bauer has had some control issues. You know, I, I could... The, the second tier starting pitchers being hurt just a little bit by walks because they're going to throw so many innings. This next one's from Arch. Dear Justin, Max, and David. That is actually a Tigers World Series rotation. So I, you know, I was not I was looking wondering. ahead. I was not <laughs> looking ahead, but that one is definitely Justin Verlander, Max Scherzer, and David Price. Okay. So Price, that's, Price a fun, with them together. that's a fun coincidence. Yeah. Yeah. He was in the... Right. He was in one of their World Series runs. Head-to-head points league. Would you be comfortable with these eight pitchers? We can only have eight starting pitchers on our roster. Hyunjin Ryu, Zach Gallen, Zach Plesak, Jack Flaherty, Mike Soroka, Corey Kluber, Bryce Wilson, Ryan Yarbrough, with Luis Severino on my IL in a dynasty league. So Ryu, Gallen, Plesak, Flaherty. You don't have a bona fide ace. A top yeah, five uh, type starting pitcher, yeah. but you have a few really good ones. Yeah, I mean, you got three guys who are definitely in my top twenty or twenty-five. I think Ryu might be just outside. Um, I think this is pretty good, though. It, it's, I think it's fine. Um, you, you've got four guys who should be pretty good, and then some wild cards. Um, this does remind me, I think, in the in that Raz Slam best ball draft. I think I took Severino, Syndergaard, and Sale. Oh my god! I'm, well, uh, it could pay off in in the second half of the season. Yeah, it might be like I I, I stink <laughs> for the first half, and then those guys shoot up like a rocket ship. Yeah, um, yeah, I think it's I think it's all right. And, and plus, you have Severino; he's still pretty young, and and he has a history of being an elite starting pitcher. He's coming back from major injuries, so. I don't know if he will get back to the same level he was before, but that is the hope. This next one's from Andrew in Detroit. Dear Miguel, Justin, and Willie. Why are we getting so much Detroit stuff today? Oh, David Price wasn't on one of their World Series teams, but he was in that on that team when Scherzer and Verlander were there. Oh, um, Detroit. This is this is Miguel Cabrera, Justin. Yeah, it Verlander. seems like Miguel Cabrera, Justin Turn, or Justin Verlander, and then I have no idea who Willie is. Now I'm stumped. Willie. It's not Willie Castro because he, he does not have an E on the end of his name. No. Those would just be Tigers. Willie. I don't know. Someone's yelling at their phone right now while they're listening to us. I'm in a 10-team 10 10 team head-to-head points league, and I have the first pick. I am going to use Scott's method of drafting five of my first six picks as pitchers. I was wondering who you guys would take as a high upside value hitter to take between rounds four and six as my first hitter. So this is a 10 team league. So anyone who goes uh, between picks 40 and 60 as a high upside head to head points bet. Yeah. And it's, it's head to head points. So, you know, the, the order is a little different, but if Aaron judge is there, I think he's the answer. That's a good call. Um, you know, I think George Springer could also be, I think Vladimir Guerrero, if you really just want to shoot for the moon, um, or Marcelo Zuna. 
any of those guys. Um, you know, Springer's sneaky good in points because of the batting leadoff part. Mm-hmm. Yeah, volume is key for points leagues. Obviously, plate discipline helps as well. Springer's going to walk a lot. He's going to score a lot of runs with the Toronto Blue Jays. I'm looking through our most recent mock draft. Bo Bichette has upside, but he's not necessarily built for this format because he doesn't walk all that yeah, much. Walk. Doesn't so, have a low strikeout rate. I do like Judge and Springer more than him, as well as Azuna. Uh, anyone else here? No, I mean, I think the names you gave were probably... Probably, yeah, I think if you can get Judge, uh, that's the way I would go. Um, and if not, Springer, Marcelo Zuna, or Rafael Devers. You know, he doesn't walk a ton either, but... Um, you know, he was very, very good in 2019. This next one's from Jeremy with a lot of ones after his name. I didn't want to count how many ones, but it looked something like 20 of them. Four <laughs> team head to head points league. I am keeping Yohan Moncada with two utility spots, but no corner infielder or middle infielder. Standard point scoring. I find the hitters I like in the first few rounds are third baseman. Should I take best player available and fill up my two utility spots while doing so? or look to another position who I view slightly less than those third basemen so I have more flexibility later in the draft. So probably talking about names like Anthony Rendon or Alex Bregman yeah. or Rafael Devers, Devers. Yeah. maybe even Arenado if, if this person likes him. Uh, so how do you feel about that, Chris? You know, Filling up your third base spot and your utility with someone like Moncada early on in the draft. So the thing about waiting around for flexibility is you're, you're basically working under the hope really not even assumption but hope that by the time you want to fill your utility spot the best player available will be someone who's already of it who plays a position that you've already filled um and you might end up being forced to take a second baseman instead of a really good third baseman later in the draft but when you're talking about Bregman, Rendon, Arenado, LeMayhew, um, you know, Vlad Jr. If he's, rel- uh, I can't think of the word, eligible at that position. Um, like those are really good players and you want really good players. And I don't have a huge problem filling my utility spot early. I mean, this is a podcast that, you know, endorses taking Nelson Cruz, Jordan Alvarez, JD Martinez, and John Carlos Stanton. Uh, so I, I don't think we're opposed to filling that utility spot early if you can get them. Um, and I, I think Bregman, Rendon, and especially Devers are really good values this year. I'm, I think I might actually have Devers slightly higher than Bregman and Rendon in my rankings. Um, but especially in points, he was league, awesome. Ren, Rendon and Bregman are just so good in that format. Yeah, that yeah, that's I wouldn't, fair. I wouldn't think twi- I wouldn't think twice about it. And and you have two utility spots. So even if Bregman and Rendon occupy third base, you have Moncada in one of your utility spots. You could still even grab another utility only bat later on in your draft, or you know whatever other player at a position you already have that that falls to a good value. So especially with two utility spots, I wouldn't over think this to to answer the question in a shorter way yes you should take the best player available there you go that's all we needed Uh, until until you reach a point where it's not where it hurts your team but that usually doesn't happen let's quickly promote a few things a quick reminder that our fantasy baseball today draft prep guide is free and of course it is available now you might be drafting this weekend you might have your draft right after you listen to this mailbag podcast or the day after Saturday or Sunday this weekend, I'm sure many people are going to be drafting. Uh, so go get our draft prep guide. The link for that is cbsports.com slash FBB draft kit. And you can find all of our rankings inside of it. Salary cap values, draft strategies, tiers, and so much more. I was going to tell people to sign up for our newsletters, but you've already done that. If you are watching this and you aren't subscribed to our YouTube channel, what are you doing? Sign up, subscribe, youtube.com slash fantasy baseball today. Hit that little subscribe button, then hit the bell right next to it, and you will get a notification every time we go live or every time we drop another video, something like our Fantasy Baseball Today and five videos that have been going up 
on this channel as well. If you are watching, don't go anywhere. If you are listening to the podcast, we are going to take a quick break. But when we return, we will get to your new regulators slash fantasy cops segment next fantasy baseball today. So we received two questions that you guys used to refer to as regulators, but for copyright purposes, we had to retire the regulators. Adam now calls it fantasy cops on fantasy football today. And it's awesome. I think it's a great bit. I'm not going to steal it from Adam. That's his thing. So what I'm thinking I'm going to go with, tell me if I'm crazy here, Chris, it's definitely not as fun or creative as Adam, but fantasy justice for all it's a little play on the metallica album and justice for all i'm a big metallica fan greatest band ever I have no problem saying that that's how i feel fantasy justice for all is exactly what we are going to call this uh and i do have a little bit of a sound by here that we can use every time we introduce it There you go. Some epic music. If you want to make something better, if you're creative enough to do so, send it in. We'll use it. Feel free to do so. Um, I'm trying to think of like Metallica songs that would work for fantasy baseball. Yeah. Um, Just if you are going to make a drop and send it to us, do not use any Metallica riffs because they've sued people for other things before. And (laughs) I don't really want to get involved with that. So (laughs) Keep that in mind. That's exactly why I did not use any type of Metallica thing myself. This one is from somebody who would like to, and and this is, of course, these are questions that are not really fantasy related. They're more so about like the commissioner or something weird that's going on in your fantasy league. This one is from somebody who would like to remain nameless, residing somewhere in the Midwest. Are you a geography guy, Chris? Because I'm not. Uh, This is something that Heath uh, used to make fun of me about. Um, But being that I am a coastal elite, uh, you know, living in my fancy Brooklyn, uh, uh, you know, third floor high rise. Um, in my brain, the Midwest basically stretches from like Western Pennsylvania to Colorado. So like 60% of the geographic, like, like Montana might be in the Midwest. I don't know. So, um, I'm going to say fire. I'm going to say Jackson Hole, Nevada. All righty. That's what we'll go with. I have been in a 15 team Roto. Oh, that's in league. Wyoming. That's in Wyoming. I'm an idiot. Wyoming. I have been in a but 15 still the team, Midwest. Still the Midwest. 15 team Roto Keeper League with the same 15 guys since 2006. Last year, some league members did not want to play uh, play the league out since it would impact our minor league system so greatly, among other things. Out of the 15, nine of us did a separate draft just so we had something to root for. Now, I never won this league out of the 16 years of its existence. I ended up winning the league last year. Besides a nice cash prize, the winner also gets the trophy, the league trophy engraved engraved with their name and year and gets to keep the trophy during the season until we all get together the following year when the trophy is moved to the new winner. The commissioner has said my name will be going on the trophy in preparations for this year's draft. This has angered some league members because it wasn't winning our, quote, league. Some one asterisk put on the trophy next to my name. What would you say? I mean, like, <laughs> if they're going to be babies about it, put an asterisk on it. Who cares? Uh, but, like, also don't be a baby about it. Like, <laughs> it doesn't matter either way. Just, like, who cares? Put an asterisk on it. I mean, it's kind of relevant, right? I mean, the whole Hall of Fame discussion with steroids and stuff. Not, I mean, it's, it's was just like, what, what does an asterisk mean? Like, oh, well, that didn't happen. Wink, wink. Like, no, we all know. Like, we all, it's like, it's like NCAA, like expunging their record books. Like, oh, Reggie Bush never played for USC. That's stupid. Like, we all know he did. This, this is meaningless. Just put the asterisk on it if they're going to complain about it. But they shouldn't complain about it. It's fine. Agreed. Fantasy justice has been served. For whom the bell tolls. (laughs) Oh, he has a second question. Also, I'm trying to figure something out that should probably be simple. A player goes for $5 in a 12-team league. In theory, should he go for more or less in a 15-team league? He should go for for more. No, he should go for less. Because you are stretching the player pool wider. Assuming, Assuming your budget is the same. 
Yeah, um, 260 standard. Yeah, I think, you know, we talk about, and this is reflected in my uh, salary cap values, in a head-to-head four points league because you have fewer roster spots and the player pool is smaller, um, you should spend more on your high-end players. And in a roto league, you should spend a little less. So I think that uh, also applies for a 15-team league because you're, well... Well, you, I think you just proved the point, Chris, because in, in a shallower league, you're, you're spending up higher because the players you can get later are going to be better players for you. Yeah. So in a 15-team league people are not going to spend as much on the high end. I mean, you're going to see people yeah. very stringent with, they're going to have caps where, okay, DeGrom's probably not going to go for more than $45. Not like some of the crazy amounts that we've seen in salary yeah. cap drafts that we've done. So I punched these these um, salary cap draft projections into the um, the auction calculator on Fangraphs yeah. using ATC projections. And Cabrian Hayes was a $5 kind of player. flattens it out. Yeah, Cabrian Hayes was a five dollar player in a twelve team league, and he was a nine dollar player in a fifteen team. That league. makes sense. Yeah, I guess it, it flattens it out so that the higher guy are lower, the lows are higher. Um, because you know the the gap between that five dollar player in a twelve team league and the one dollar players is much bigger in a fifteen team league. So, I guess that makes sense. We have another fantasy justice for all question. This one's from Cote. C O T E Cote. I guess that's how you would go Cody? with that. Cody. All right. Cote. So there's you know, Greg Cody. There's from the Levitard show. Greg Cody. It's the only time I've seen that word. Need an opinion. We have a points league with two new managers entering a 12 man dynasty league. One team is decisively better than the other. So we thought to redraft the two teams between the two managers. This may be a bit confusing, but team a gets pick one and team B gets pick two and three, and then team A gets pick four, and then the picks go back and forth. So pick five is team B, six would be team A, so far and so far and so forth. Um, it's what are your thoughts format for the first two rounds and then just yeah. alternating. What are your thoughts, and do you think this is fair? We thought this was kind of fair to even out the higher-end talent from the previous owners. I recently joined Scott White's Dynasty League, and there were... There was me and and two other new owners and uh, league managers, and that's exactly what we did. We had a a draft similar to this. I had the first pick. The next person had two picks, and then whoever was picking third had three picks. And then I think we just went back to me after that. But yeah, I think this is fine. I don't. I, I don't think see here. Team B probably has a slight advantage if you're looking at like. They get two and three plus five, seven, eight, nine, eleven. So team A has the highest pick, but then they have the lower pick every other time. Um, so should you do one, two picks, and then two picks, and then one, 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 one like I, that? Yeah, I think it should be A, B, B, A, A, B, A, B. I think that's, but I, it could also, you could snake it further in the draft. It It probably doesn't matter all that much, but maybe you go, you do uh, f- three rounds of a snake or four rounds of a snake, and then you go alternating. I, I, it probably doesn't make that big of a difference. And, um, you know, there, if people quit the league, I'm going to guess there aren't that many great players. Fantasy justice has been served. Master. Master. Fantasy baseball at cbsi.com. Let's hit some of your emails. This one is from Sean Millerick, who actually wrote this beauty. Dear CJ, Mike, Paul, and JT. CJ, JT Real Muto. CJ, uh, CJ McCollum. Mike Jordan. And Paul O'Neill. Uh, no, hope- I think these are Marlins catchers. JT I think it's Charles Johnson, Mike Piazza, Paula Duca, and JT Realmuto. I know oh, Sean oh. is a, I believe he is a Marlins fan. Uh, oh, so I mm. I th- wow. think that's what he's going for. Yes. It's Mike Piazza's I- legendary run as a Florida Marlin. <laughs> Might be. Uh, hope you guys are doing well. Have always wanted to ask about something. My 10 team head to head points has a rule where we have specific outfield spots, left field, center field, and right field. How much should I adjust outfield outfielders in rankings as a result? For example, seeing Yaz as just about must 
roster thoughts. I have never played in a league like this, Chris. I have always wanted to play in a league like this. Scrap the three outfielders, make it specific left field, center field, and right field. I guess it gets wonky for guys who kind of play all over the outfield, but I've always wanted to play in a league like this, and I never have. Yeah, there will be multi-eligible guys. Um, I'm, can you fill in for about 12 more seconds while I, I try to load something into Excel? Yeah, let's figure it out. I Let's look up how many games Mike Yastrzemski played at each, each outfield spot last season, and I will try to f- figure that out while I am talking to you here. But of course, Mike Yastrzemski is... Our, our rankings uh, in our back-end tool actually do separate out by position. So Mike Trout's a center fielder, Juan a left fielder, etc. So I want to you know, just kind of take a quick look. At um, Mike Shremsky played 24 games in center field last year. I did not know that he played 31 games in right field. So I guess it depends how much eligibility you need from the, the season before, but either way, he's going to Mike Shremsky is probably going to have center field and right field eligibility in this format. And, and it's his, his prefer, preferred format. Shremsky is great in points leagues. All right. So my number 12 center fielder, is my number 181 player overall, my number 46 outfielder. So center field scenes, uh, this is in a points format, does seem a little weaker. Mm -hmm. Um, My number 12 left fielder is Kyle Schwarber, who's my number 35 outfielder overall. So I'm going to guess right field is overrepresented and center field is a little underrepresented based on this. Yeah. Um, if you can get Yastrzemski as a center fielder based on him playing 24 games last year, I love it. Yeah, he's uh, he's my number 11 right fielder, but he's the number 29 uh, um, right fielder. Is he? Yeah. So he's listed as a right fielder in, in our leagues, at least, primarily. Um, so, you know, I, I think... You know, there, there are a couple of guys like Kevin Biggio and Brandon Lau who are outfield eligible, but, you know, are primary position otherwise. But um, I think I would say right field seems the strongest of them. This one is from, I did not write your name down, so I apologize. But they said, Dear Al, Kevin, AJ, Annabelle, Henderson, and Edison. There are so many. It's all Marlins and Tigers today. These are Marlins pitchers. Al Leiter, Kevin Brown, AJ Burnett, Anibal Sanchez, Henderson Alvarez, and Edinson Volquez. Do you know what they all have in common? You probably do not because you are not they a Marlins fan. are all, I was going to say right-handed pitchers, but Al Leiter is not. Yeah, that's, that's not the answer. They are the Marlins pitchers, and this is from Sean on as well um these are the marlins pitchers who have thrown a no hitter uh oh. in a game Did I the, really two questions from sean wow i'm so nice yeah the um i, I believe mean, the list for the mets would be quite a bit shorter this is one name right uh yeah i think it's what is it johan, johan Santana. Santana's the only mets no hitter right yeah, I think that's right. Working on my draft ranks and found myself wondering how the pros do it. How do you stay disciplined slash focused when putting these together? For example, I don't quote like Trent Grisham or Denelson Lamette, but figured I had to be wrong when I realized I made it to 92 without thinking about them. So they're just kind of chucked in there in the mid 90s on my list. Also feel like I always hit a point where I'm just listing players I've heard of more than really thinking. Tends to be when I go to bed. <laughs> guess uh, the process question more than anything uh how many days go into your initial ranks do you do your position list first then the master one or vice versa i do the master one first um and you know the the hard thing about rankings is like i've been dealing with this with with my early football rankings where i'm doing projections for those and then ranking based off that and like I have Jonathan Taylor 14th, which is super low relative to everyone else. He's like number eight or, or higher for most other people. Um, and I have Cam Akers 19. And it's like, wow, why am I so low on these guys? And then I look at it and it's like, well, number 19 is like 
13 points behind number 10 or something. Uh, and so we have these ordinal ranking lists, one, two, three, four, five. But for me, the gap between Ronald Acuna and Jose Ramirez is $2 in my salary cap values, but it's eight spots or seven spots. So, you know, I, I think, you know, when he says sometimes it feels like I'm just throwing players in, sometimes there aren't, aren't real differences with players. And we'll get a question like, why do you have this guy 140 and this guy 165? And it's like, it doesn't really matter. Like there's not really, you know, you reach a point where the differences between players are very slim. Um, so I, I don't think like, I wouldn't say your process is wrong if you're doing it. You just have to, you know, go through and, and make sure it makes sense. But the way I started my prospect, my rankings this year was, and I think it's probably very different from Scott and Frank's. Um, but I basically compiled all of the ADP data that I could, all of the projections that I could, and kind of did a weighted measure for those. And that was my starting point. And obviously then I, you know, I don't like Trent Grisham or Denelson Lamette, just like Sean, but they ended up really high in those things because they're projected and, and ranked pretty high. So I moved them down. And that's where personal preference comes in. Um, and that was more just for like an ease of use kind of thing, uh, rather than having to, come up with the the list of players that was more just to get a list of players um but yeah uh i i think you know throwing in a trent grisham or denelson Lamette, like how do you stay disciplined if you don't like trent grisham and you think he's the number 93 player you should have him as 93 and you should stand by it um i know scott somewhat disagrees he tries to reflect how drafts will go in addition to his personal rankings but for me, at least, you know, players are ranked where I, I think they should be. I don't really worry about where they're going or where other people have them ranked. So I would say that I probably use a process that's similar to yours, Chris. It's not, I don't aggregate it as accurately. I don't have mm -hmm. ADP and projections all combined together, but I am looking at all of those things while yeah. I'm making my decisions for rankings. So I guess once ADP, came out with the early mock drafts back in like October and NFB, yeah. NFBC drafts started happening in November. I'm taking notes and I'm probably using that as a jumping off point. But then as projections start to come out, Seamer projections come out usually in December or ATC, a few other projections come out a couple of later on, uh, a couple of months later on. I will use those projections. I will use the, the fan graphs auction calculator and um, kind of see how their, their value spit out there. Yeah. And of course, I will do the research for each player. I mean, you know, yeah. you hear it when we do our position previews. I mean, we're deep diving all these players. And I've looked at, you know, last 162 for a lot of guys and uh, underlying skills, strikeout rate, swinging strike rate for pitchers and uh, walk rate, contact rate for hitters, looking a lot at stat cast stuff to see, you know, what stands out to me, what doesn't. And ultimately, while there's not just a formula that I have, like an algorithm, it's all of those things combined, looking at splits yeah. as well, and just kind of forming this opinion on that player. And if I like them more than ADP, then I move them up higher in my rankings. And that's basically how I do it. Yeah. Uh, this, this next one's from David. I'm in a 14-team head-to-head points keeper league. We each keep five players, and I kept Garrett Cole, Juan Soto, Manny Machado, and Jack Flaherty. Jack Flaherty and Sonny Gray. Due to trades and keeper rules, I will only have five picks in the first 12 rounds. Round 6, 8, 9, 11, and 12. In rounds 13 to 20, however, I will have 13 picks. This includes seven picks in rounds 14 to 17. Given my keepers and where most of my picks will fall, who are some guys that I can target in that round 14 to 17 range? Picks 196 to 238 who can be every week starters. This will help me determine what to target with my early, with my few early picks. So, so this is worth keeping in mind. Usually when we're talking about keepers, you're talking about inflated prices uh, because those players aren't on the board. But in this case, you know, keeping Garrett Cole presumably costs him a first round pick. Mm -hmm. Keeping Juan Soto presumably costs him a second, et cetera. So players should generally go more or less where they should. There will be, you know, relative to ADP player values will be inflated just because you'll have, you know, someone who has 
Fernando Tatis as a 14th round pick or whatever, if he kept him from 2018 through now or something like that. Um, as far as the answer to this question, you know, looking at ADP, some names that stand out um, among pitchers, Marco Gonzalez, Mike Soroka should get there eventually. Uh, Frankie Montas. You'd hope Shohei Otani. I really like Herman Marquez. I not. I don't necessarily think he's an every week starter, but he's a must start guy when he's on the road. Um, Tyler Aaron Malley, Savale. Aaron Savale. Like- yeah, I like him a lot. Uh, actually, like him a lot uh, lately. Framber Valdez. Actually, you know, I, I don't know if he'll actually fall there, but it sounds like he. Um, he may not be out for the year, which uh, did you guys talk about that on Wednesday's podcast or, or did we talk about that on Thursday's podcast that we haven't recorded yet? We spoke about it on uh, Thursday morning's podcast. Okay, good. good. Most people probably have heard by now. Good, good. Scott, uh, Scott's very excited. Don't you? I, I made the mistake of talking, talking down for Amber Valdez and he, Scott did not like that. So yeah, I, I think for Amber Valdez, you know, should be ranked higher than this, you know, and, and he will be moving forward. I'm not sure he's a top 100 pick for me. I would imagine he is for Scott. Um, but, you know, if, if he does fall there, I think that's a good one. And then on the hitter side, um, you know, you're always going to be looking at players with flaws in this kind of range. But Christian Vasquez, a catcher, Victor Robles, I really like. Um, I think there's huge steals potential there. Dylan Carlson. Max Kepler's kind of a boring guy, but he could be, he should be an every week starter. Clint Frazier, uh, Miguel Sano, if you need power. AJ Pollock is probably underrated um, at 181 in ADP. And I think the same can be said of Josh Donaldson. There are playing time concerns for both, though. Andrew McCutcheon, I'll throw out there. He's boring, yep. but he'll be reliable. Austin Riley, I think, can work his way into being an every week kind of starting player. I don't know that that will be the case. Right from the get-go, a little bit further down, uh, Nick Senzel, someone that is I'm getting pretty excited about. Andrew Vaughn can work his way into being a starter on your fantasy teams as well. Of mm-hmm. course, the White Sox top prospect, so we're excited about him. Even further down, Aaron Hicks. They're talking about him batting third for the Yankees. Mitch yep. Hanniger, uh could lead off for the Seattle Mariners. So those were a few names that also stood out to me. And this I'll, one's- I'll throw out uh, Tommy LaStella, who's going in the 300 range, but looks like he should be the everyday leadoff hitter for the giants. And um, I, I think he's one of the best values in drafts right now. This one's from RD. I am in a 12 team head to head five by five salary cap keeper league mouthful. What is the money limit to keeping closers, particularly someone like Trevor Rosenthal? So I have Rosenthal for $10. Scott has him for 12 and Chris has him for three. Yeah, I'm I'm lower on closers, I think, across the board than either of you. Um, and my gut is to say for Rosenthal, like if you could keep Rosenthal for three, I think that'd be fine. I I probably wouldn't be super interested in keeping any closer for more than about five dollars. Um, like if I had Liam Hendricks or Josh Hader for five dollars, obviously I would keep them. But for the most part you'll closers will fall in your in your uh draft and you'll be able to get some for that price if you want them this one's from ian mccoy 14 team head-to-head categories league where you roster six starting pitchers would you feel comfortable with a pitching staff of strasburg plesak glass now lament arias <laughs> dunning i know it's a lot of names you guys like what but i feel like they are all also big question marks so i'm in a bit of a Panic post draft. I, I yeah, mean, are there guys that we like? I, I mean, we like like Scott really likes Plezak. I think we all like Glass now. I think we have questions about uh, innings. Um, yeah. We all liked Strasburg before the calf injury. Yeah. Um, uh, there is an episode of Thirty Rock, which I'm in the process of rewatching, where they uh, their parent company, NBC's parent company, Cable Town with a K. Uh, decides to expand into Couch Town with a K, and they create a, a Made in American couch. Um, and it is sitting in it is described as, um, you know, like a, a like the kind of torture positions that 
get used at various black sites. And that is how I feel when you ask if I feel comfortable with a pitching staff of Strasburg, Plezak, Glasnow, Lamette, Arias, and Dunning. And I don't say that to, you know, necessarily be super critical of your team because I think that could be really good. There's a ton of potential there. It's all but boomer bust. When you ask if I'm comfortable, the answer is pretty obviously no. I'm very uncomfortable if that's my pitching staff. Um, but that looks more like a pitching staff I would build than one Frank or Scott would build. Yeah, too risky for me, even in a 14-team league. There's huge upside. Again, this is this is boomer bust. I mean, your pitching staff could be the best two months into the season, or yeah. you might be missing uh, Strasburg, Glass now, and Denelson Lamette, and, and you're going to be left scrambling on the waiver wire. So, And please, I could have a 470 RA. All possible. This one's from Todd in London. Hey, guys, thanks so much for all the draft prep you've been doing. I'm in an 11-team OBP Roto Keeper League and have a question about how to approach the turn. Because it's a keeper, the talent distribution is kind of strange, and the big three starters will definitely be drafted by my picks at 11 and 12. The best starting pitchers available are Darvish and Bauer. Should I take them both at 11, 12, or should I go, or should I go Darvish and a bat there? Looking at ADP slash Yahoo ranks, the best bats available are likely to be Lindor, Harper, or Machado. My keepers all in later rounds are Fernando Tatis, Juan Soto, Cody Bellinger, Keston Hira, Luke Voigt, and Corbin Burns. Yeah, you should take Darvish and Bauer. I agree. <laughs> that one, I mean, like, once you get to the end of that question, you're like, oh, your your offense is already awesome. You should like, it would take pictures. <laughs> it would be awesome to get you know, in an OBP league, like it would be awesome to get Bryce Harper uh, with an 11th or 12th pick, but mm -hmm. I think you got to go pitching. But what I would suggest here is once you've got Darvish, Bauer and Burns, I'm good. I'm good until like the 12th pick. I'm, I'm going to keep focusing on offense there. Even with Tati, Soto, Bellinger, etc. I'm that is such a good start at starting pitcher. Mm -hmm. that uh, I'm comfortable, you know, waiting until like if I can get Sandy Alcantara in the 10th round and, you know, have then three guys who I feel really good about throwing a lot of innings, plus Corbin Burns, who I, I think is a star. I'm I that's kind of like. That's pretty close to like my ideal starting pitcher build. In an 11 team league, I I might want to grab at least one more a little bit earlier. At the maybe not your three four turn, but the five six, if you can get a a paddock or whoever you like in that range, Kyle Hendricks, Zach Wheeler, Jose Barrios, Charlie Morton, if you like him as well, um, I, I would probably look to grab at least one more top thirty ish starting pitcher there to to pair with those other three that you already have. Uh, this one's from Matt, dear Dwight, Jim, and Andy. That's from uh, that's from Seinfeld, right? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it's a late reaction. Always great. Uh, so listening to Sorry, I was reading the email. <laughs> it's all good. So listening to the pod today, uh, been loving each day, by the way, about strategy. This might have came in a while ago. And as I've heard all spring long about how everyone is paying up for big time starting pitchers and going after them early. When I hear you guys mentioning to zig when everyone else zags, this is perfect that Chris is on. I'm happy. you're here. Yeah, that's just that's not you guys. That's just me. It's just they're you. they're 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 zagging. Is Frank this and Scott are just zagging. Is this a year to maybe load up on hitting early and obviously based upon the league settings, wait to wait on starting pitcher and load up on closers later in the draft by drafting four to five elite relievers, loading saves early, then trading them off for a starting pitcher later on in the year. As long as you have enough innings to meet the league minimum, wouldn't the strategy be a way to combat everyone going after starters so early? I never thought about it this way because I mean... This is even different than what you would do, Chris, because yeah. I mean, he's talking about investing in in closers, which you wouldn't you would say not to do either. But if yeah. you can load up on those, build up a huge lead in saves, and then trade them off for elite starting pitchers, I don't know how realistic it is to do that. But that's the thing. It sounds like an interesting strategy. It, you know, I, I have this reaction every time there's like a a contract. This happens a lot in the NBA where it's like well, it might be an overpay or this guy might not be good, but we can use him as trade bait later. Uh, and like, if you're acquiring a player with the intention of trading them later, you probably just shouldn't acquire that player. <laughs> um, and you should just try to acquire um, 
you know, like my, my strategy is loading up on hitting early when everybody's going for starting pitchers, but it's also avoiding relievers entirely so that I can still compete at starting pitcher while not investing as much as everyone else. So, you know, you have to make a sacrifice somewhere and relievers have such relatively little value uh, compared to hitters and starting pitchers over the course of a season that I, I would, um, I, I just think investing in them is, is not worthwhile. This last one that we're going to take today is from Brendan, who made us this awesome Rhythm of the Night compilation last year. I'll play a little snippet of it. I have it pulled up here. Fernando, Fernando Tatis, Tatis, Tatis. I don't know what you did against Scott White to like come out of his shell. Of all the dramatic things I've ever seen. A double dunk. <laughs> Not horrible, but, uh, you know, underwhelming. Well, his voice sounds like hot garbage. <laughs> this is the rhythm of the night. Oh, my good, goodness gracious. Scott White after dark. Oh, I was banging it hard. He is back. This is great. Can you believe this is Aaron Judge? Yes. <laughs> I can't. Do your homework, sir. Adam. Adam. I want to crush his soul. Aren't you kind of like a fantasy dictator? Yeah. <laughs> it's it's not just for sex appeal. <laughs> his very presence an uplifting adventure. Bye bye. It's not just for sex That's appeal. Chris. That was great stuff. Uh, so let's help Brandon out, and we'll wrap up here. I'm in a ten team head to head points keeper league where we decided to have the last four to five rounds of a 25 round draft become keeper picks. Keep two out of those five rounds for the next year in the same round. As long as you keep that player on your roster all year, guys I'm targeting are definitely Jared Kelnick, Andrew Vaughn, Mackenzie Gore, Casey Mize, Dylan Carlson, etc. But I am interested to hear in this format, what players you Scott and Chris would take as keepers in a head to head points 10 teamer within rounds 20 to 25. So between picks 200 and 250, anyone that stands out there, Chris, who you would hold on to all year long, that might be worth keeping for the following year. And Scott and I recently had a conversation about Casey Mize on our prospect podcast. Yep. I am, I'm pretty down on him. And the uh, control has been way, way off in the spring. I didn't like what I saw last year. And it's just something about guys that rely on their splitter so much, Chris. It's it's different if it's okay. Frankie Montas throws it fifteen to twenty percent of the time. It's his second or third offering. But Kevin Gosman, you have seen the inconsistency year in and year out. It is so hard to command a splitter that you throw forty percent of the time. And I kind of feel that that is the route that Casey Mize is going down. He's also had shoulder injuries as well. So uh, you can talk about Casey Mize if you want, and any other prospects in that range. Yeah, I like Casey Mize quite a bit. Um... You know, I've done a couple prospects drafts where he's been a target of mine. I, I'm happy to take him in the later rounds or reserve rounds in a in any league. And you know, the biggest thing for me is his velocity has been up in in spring, so that makes me think that he is at least right now healthy. And you know, he throws a splitter 18 percent of the time, but you know, he's really got a legitimate four or five pitch mix. Um, you know, his his arsenal reminds me of Max Scherzer. Sheesh. You know, Casey Mize, huh? It's, oh, Chris is breaking up here. Chris, you got a, are you here? Her, her Chris uh, is breaking uh, okay. up. Yeah, I'm here. He's back. Am I here? Okay. Yeah, you, there yeah you I like Casey Mize quite a bit. Um, the Arsenal kind of reminds me of, like, there's some Max Scherzer there. He's a, a big, intimidating presence on the mound. Throws hard. He's got that. Uh, you know, power arsenal with the 80, you know, 90 mile an hour cutter or, you know, 80, 80 to 86 to 90 mile an hour cutter, uh, 86 mile an hour splitter, 81 mile an hour curveball. And the velocity's back this spring, which is a big thing because, like you said, he has dealt with shoulder issues um, dating back to college, I believe. But he's averaging like 95 miles per hour with his fastball in spring compared to 93.6 last season. So he's definitely a buy low target of mine. I, I would say, 
the name that immediately stands out to me for this question when you're talking about from the 200 to 250 range, guys who you might want to keep for next year, uh, it's Joe Adele, who is still one of the best prospects. What's that? This is a points league, though, Chris. So if you lose points I mean, for a strikeout. Look, if, if Joe Adele becomes the Joe Adele we hope he will be, I don't think it's going to be an issue whether it's a points or head-to-head uh, or roto league. Um, and look, I, he struck out a ton last year. I think he had only played like 180 games as a professional before that. He was 21 years old. So uh, I love drafting Joe Adele in the late rounds and in this format. You know, assuming you can keep him on your bench for the first month of the season when he's not likely to be with the team, um, I, I think that could be one of the absolute, you know, best values in that range. I stand corrected on uh, Casey Mize. I misspoke. I, I I really thought he used the splitter much more than he actually does. But yeah, eighteen percent. So I will, uh, I will go back on what I said there. But uh, the command control, the control has stuff, been bad in and it's weird for him because I mean his control has been so good in the minors. So yeah, it you know it should it should bounce back. It should regress positively. But um, I think honestly, just between the two, I would take T- Tarek Skubal over uh, Casey Mize right now, just based on everything yeah. I've seen and working with driveline baseball this off season. He's looked really good in the spring too. Not that I want to put too much stock into that, but I, I really like what I've seen from Scooble. So I'll throw his name in there. I will obviously Wander Franco goes a little bit outside of 250, but if he's available, uh, that's a no brainer. Andrew Vaughn, yeah. you brought up uh, Austin Riley, I think still is technically a prospect ish kind of guy. Nick Senzel, a name that we've talked a lot about I'm trying to think of uh but Bobby don't Witt. just think, don't just think, don't just think of prospects. Luis Severino, Noah Syndergaard, and Chris Sale would all be great picks in that twenty to twenty-five round range. Sure. Uh, Severino is ranked highest of them, followed by Syndergaard, and then Sale for me. Um, and you know, you you know, with Syndergaard, you may only have to stash him for a month, and then you may have a a top fifteen pitcher for start for twenty twenty one. Uh, second half and then all of 2022 for a you know 22nd round pick that's pretty awesome that is pretty awesome he recently put out a video of him throwing off of the mound and he was wearing a shirt so i was actually proud of noah Syndergaard for that <laughs> we're gonna wrap there for chris i'm frank thank you all for listening and watching fantasy baseball today we will not be on the podcast tomorrow you will hear danny vietti and will middlebrooks they are previewing the national league central from an actual baseball perspective but you will hear us again on monday Bye bye